Hey everybody, my name is Annie Elise. This is Tend to Life. Welcome back or welcome to my channel for the first time. If you're like, uh, welcome back, I've never seen you. Uh, who are you lady on my screen? My name's Annie. Uh, this is Tend to Life. This is my channel where I talk all things true crime and I have got another crazy ass case for you today. One that has a lot of people out there divided. Kind of like a he said, she said, a lot of people are standing with the victim, a lot of people are standing with the perpetrator, a lot of people are saying it's all smoke and mirrors. So we've got a lot to talk about and I want you to decide and you tell me where you stand on this case. But before we do all of that guys in the comment section, let me just like give this PSA really quick. Please be kind in the comments because although this case is highly controversial and we welcome everybody's opinions, Let's do so in a grown up and respectful manner and like not bash other people if their opinion doesn't align with our own. All right, now I'm gonna get off my soapbox. I'm gonna grab a big drink of water and we are about to get into it. Okay guys, do you have trouble sleeping or trouble staying asleep? Because I do and I have for as long as I can remember. Well, correction, up until about a year ago, which is when my husband introduced me to Beam Dream Tea. Now, you might have heard me talk about it before, but if you haven't, let me tell you. Dream is this like luxurious dessert tasting tea that is filled with the highest quality sleep promoting ingredients. So my go-to flavor is sea salt caramel because it literally tastes like hot chocolate, which is so, so good. But they also have chocolate peanut butter, a cinnamon cocoa, mint chip. I mean, the list of flavors goes on. Which, let me also just say this, guys, I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here. What New Year's resolutions are you prioritizing? And how can good sleep with dream help you achieve them because for me I know I am not waking up and working out or focusing on better habits if I'm dead tired I'm human I'm not Superman and I need sleep in order to be my best self especially if I'm going to start doing my goals for the year that I have set for myself now I also wear a sleep tracking aura ring and my scores when I started drinking this went from the 60s to the literal mid 90s all with beam. It is honestly unbelievable. And we all know that better sleep means more energy, better mood, better skin, all of the things. Plus at just 15 calories and zero added sugar, it's a no brainer for me because it tastes like literal dessert. I love that Dream has high quality sleep ingredients that leave me with zero grogginess the next day, which all these other sleep aids that I've tried before always leave me kind of just like, oh, walking like a zombie, not with beam. And in a clinical study, 93% of participants reported that dream helped them get a better night's sleep and wake up feeling more refreshed and i am so 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 beyond excited to officially announce that beam is now an official partner of this channel for 2024 which just makes me so happy because i just absolutely love them and now i get to share my sleep secrets with you and hook you guys up with sweet deals all year long so click the link below or scan the qr code and use code 10 to life to get up to 35 percent off so sweet dreams 10 to lifers thank me later on February 12th, 1976, Jason Corbett was born in Limerick, Ireland. He wasn't the only baby boy born that day either, as his twin brother Wayne arrived along with him. Now, Jason had a total of eight siblings, and while his family didn't have a lot of money growing up, their parents provided everything that they needed. So the kids didn't ever really notice that they didn't have a lot of money and they had a really happy childhood. Even as a teenager, Jason was always a hardworking person, and he would work multiple multiple jobs to help provide for his family. The people who knew him described Jason as thoughtful, generous, and a really fun person to be around. He would eventually meet a woman named Margaret, and they fell absolutely in love. Now, Margaret went by Mags for short, but like I said, the two of them fell deeply in love. They considered each other one another's soulmates, and they eventually got married. Now, even though they were in love and happy, more than anything, Jason and Mags wanted to have children. So they were overjoyed when in September of 2004, they had their first son, a son named Jack. Two years later, they would welcome their second child, a daughter named Sarah. 
and everything seemed to be going perfectly as they were growing their family. However, their picture-perfect life would face an unexpected catastrophe on November 21st, 2006, just 11 weeks after Mags gave birth to Sarah. Mags had asthma, and she had a bad history of asthma attacks, and that day in November, she wasn't feeling very well. So she ended up using her inhaler and her nebulizer, both of which were supposed to help her breathe better if she was struggling. However, later that night, she woke up and she was still having a hard time breathing. So figuring that it was just an asthma attack, Jason called an ambulance and then hopped in the car to meet the ambulance halfway. But while on the way, Mags stopped breathing in the car. And Jason tried to revive her, but he was unsuccessful and she was tragically deceased. Now, this was an obviously huge loss for Jason, Sarah, and Jack. Jason lost the love of his life, and Jack and Sarah lost their mother. Jason had to adjust to being a single parent, but he had a great family, and he had friends who would pitch in as much as they could whenever they needed help. They did their best to support him, but Jason was also a very self-sufficient person, and he didn't like depending on other people. So he decided to start looking into hiring a full-time nanny. Now, initially, Jason had a hard time finding a nanny who fit in with the family. He went through two different au pairs before finding a 24-year-old named Molly Martins, who seemed like the perfect person for the job. Molly was born on September 28, 1983, and she was raised in a very wealthy neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee. Her father, Tom, who was an attorney and ended up working for the FBI, and her mother, Sharon, who had a doctorate in math from Emory University. She just kind of had this rock-solid life and upbringing. Molly had three brothers who were all academically and athletically gifted, and Molly, too, swam for her local swim team. And even though she really enjoyed it, she wasn't the best or the fastest swimmer. Now, you see, while growing up, Molly had some issues with one of her feet. She had to get multiple surgeries, which led to her missing a lot of school. And as she got older, her physical struggles unfortunately started taking a toll on her mentally as well. Molly started experiencing anxiety and depression, and because of this, she had to take even more time off from school during her junior year in high school. But despite all of these struggles, Molly was still able to graduate in 2003, and she began attending Clemson University, hoping to one day become a doctor. While away at college, it seemed like her anxiety and depression would start to get better for a while, just for it to come back even worse. It was like her moods were all over the place, and not only that, but she began suffering from very severe migraines as well. And just when it seemed like things couldn't get any worse, Molly came down with a very bad case of mono. So she and her parents decided that it would be best for her to take some time away from school. So after seeking treatment for her mental health, Molly was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which explained the highs and the lows in her moods that she had been dealing with. However, having a diagnosis didn't mean that she instantly got better and Molly decided to move back to Knoxville to be closer to her family. Her parents had a condo that they rented to her, and she had various jobs, like working as a receptionist at a hair salon, and she even tried modeling for a little while. So after getting settled back in Knoxville, Molly decided that she wanted to start dating. So she made a profile on a dating website, and she ended up meeting a man named Keith Muggin. They actually fell for each other right away, and it wasn't long before Keith and Molly were living together. Even though they were in love, Keith had said that Molly was one of the saddest people, though, that he had ever met, and that being in a relationship with her was a whirlwind. According to Keith, Molly had still been suffering with her mental health and thought that maybe getting married and having children would give her a new sense of purpose. So he eventually proposed, and shortly after, Molly became pregnant. However, her first pregnancy tragically ended in a miscarriage, and this caused her mental health to deteriorate even further, and it caused her to check into a medical rehabilitation center in Atlanta, Georgia. She received treatment for her bipolar disorder and was there for four days before returning home. After returning to Knoxville, Molly started expressing interest in moving to Europe to become an au pair. Now, within days, she found that job listing that Jason Corbett had posted looking for a nanny in Ireland. Keith tried to convince Molly to slow down before making such a big decision because her mental state still wasn't stable, and Keith didn't think that moving to a different country would be good for her at that point in time. However, Molly was set. She had her mind made up. She knew that this is what she wanted to do. So she applied for the job. After receiving Molly's resume, Jason was immediately impressed. 
On it, she had claimed to have graduated from Clemson University and said that she had actually been approved to be a foster parent as well. So, after having issues with two previous au pairs, Jason hoped that Molly would be just the right fit. He and Molly discussed things over the phone, and Jason decided to hire her, even without ever meeting her in person. Next thing you know, in March of 2008, Molly was flying out to Ireland. A friend of Jason's picked her up from the airport, but he was a little worried that Molly wasn't actually what Jason needed in his life at that very moment. Because Molly was young, she was attractive, and when she got off the plane, Molly looked like she was getting ready to go out, not like she had just spent hours flying, and she didn't necessarily seem like someone who was ready to step into the role of a responsible caretaker. So Jason's friend worried that since Molly was so beautiful, that Jason might fall for her and enter into a relationship that he really was not ready for at all. After all, Mags had only passed away a year ago at this point, so his concerns might have actually had some validity. Now, it's rumored that Molly and Jason slept together on the day that she arrived. Molly denied this, but her fiancé, Keith, did notice a change in their relationship as soon as she arrived in Ireland. He was under the impression that they were still very much together, but he hadn't heard from Molly at all after she left. So after not hearing from his fiance for 10 days, he decided to call her himself. And strangely, when she answered, Molly basically told Keith, hey, we're over, I'm done, I'm, we are done, this relationship is finished. Then, months after arriving in Ireland, Jason and Molly became an official couple. And for the most part, the people in Jason's life really liked her. Even though she hadn't been super forthcoming about her life back in the States, she was nice and seemed to be making Jason really happy, which that's all that really mattered to his friends. However, there were a few people who didn't get a good feeling about Molly. Tracy, Jason's sister, felt like she was trying to distance him from his loved ones by constantly telling him how much she didn't like his friends, almost as though she was trying to isolate him so that he would be more dependent on her. Their relationship had rocky moments as well. So many, in fact, that at one point, the couple had decided to live apart for a while. They both agreed that it felt like the relationship was moving far too fast, and Jason felt like he needed some space. However, despite agreeing to take some time apart, they never really went through with those plans. Instead, they decided to just move into a different house. Because Molly had expressed that she didn't like living somewhere that Mags, his deceased wife, had lived at some point. She had again been struggling with her mental health and had claimed that living in Mag's shadow was causing her emotions to fluctuate. It's as if they thought that the excitement of a new house would somehow curb Molly's internal jealousy, but it was actually more of just a band-aid to cover up her real issues. Molly wanted a fresh start to her and Jason's relationship, and this is what she thought would definitely make that dream a reality. However, they weren't addressing the root of their problems, and emails during this time show Jason and Molly continuing to fight periodically. But despite all of this, Molly and Jason had fallen in love with each other, and they felt like they were each other's soulmates. Even though she was engaged before, Molly had felt so lost before coming to Ireland, and she said that being with Jason and his kids made her feel like she had purpose in her life. It made her feel like she was needed, which was something that she had been searching for for a really long time. She also really grew to love Jack and Sarah, and they loved her too. As a mother figure, they bonded to her very quickly, and Molly loved caring for them. So Molly being so good with the kids made Jason really happy and strengthened his feelings toward her. But as time went on, Molly started feeling really homesick. She wanted to move back to America to be near her family and her friends, and Molly claimed that Jason wanted this too. According to her, Jason felt like the kids would have access to more opportunities in America. However, Jason's sister Tracy has denied this, claiming that Jason didn't actually ever want to leave Ireland, and he only moved because Molly didn't give him a choice. Apparently, Molly gave him an ultimatum to either move to America or to break up. So Jason eventually agreed and took things a step further by proposing to Molly in 2010. But instead of getting married in Ireland, the couple decided to move first. Now, if you've ever moved, you know how much of a hassle it can be. So I really can't imagine having to move four people's entire lives, including children, all the way from Ireland to the United States. It's easy to see why they wanted to get all of that out of the way before planning a wedding that is a huge undertaking. So they bought a large, beautiful home in Davidson County, North Carolina, and Jason was able to find a job really quickly. 
Fortunately, the packing company that Jason worked for in Ireland had a manufacturing plant in North Carolina, and so they were able to easily transfer him there. And Molly was mostly a stay-at-home mom, but also worked part-time as a swim instructor. So in 2011, shortly after moving to North Carolina, Molly and Jason got married in Molly's hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. According to Molly, the day was perfect. Sarah was the flower girl and Jack was the ring bearer, and everyone, including Jason, was happy and just having a great time. There weren't any issues, and in Molly's opinion, it was your typical happy wedding. But like I said, that's just according to Molly. And other people remember that day very differently. According to members of Jason's family, Molly was an absolute bridezilla and was yelling at various people all throughout the day. It would be for the most insignificant things too, and she would sometimes just go off on someone. She apparently even yelled at a child for eating McDonald's at the reception instead of the food that was provided. On top of that, she was overheard telling the bridesmaids that she knew Mags before she died of cancer and that Mags would want her to be with Jason. But as we know, both of those statements aren't true at all, because one, Mags didn't die from cancer, and two, Molly never knew Mags. Molly only knew about Mags after she started working for Jason. But Molly was no stranger to bending the truth, and she actually had a reputation as a known liar. For starters, she lied on her resume about graduating from Clemson University, even though we know she dropped out after her first year. She also stated that she was approved to be a foster parent, but that was never true either. When she first came to Ireland, she also lied about her relationship status. She told Jason she was single, but at that point, she was still technically with her fiancé, Keith. Molly's roommate at Clemson also remembers that Molly had a picture of a little girl on her desk, and she said that the girl in the picture was her sister, who died from cancer. And one day when Molly was gone from the room, her roommate looked at the picture a little bit closer, and she said that it said 5 by 7 in the corner. So the picture wasn't a picture of Molly's sister, it was actually a stock photo that came with the frame. I mean... What? So another time, apparently, was during a fight with Jason, and Molly had emailed him saying that other than my sister's death, nothing has ever devastated me so much. But if you remember, Molly only had brothers. She never even had a sister. So Molly's reputation as a liar would continue to grow as their life in North Carolina unfolded. For the most part, the couple was well-liked in their neighborhood, Jason especially. He was known as kind of like king of the cul-de-sac, and everyone was friendly with him, and he was friendly with everybody. The neighbors would often get together and sit outside drinking and chatting, and everyone knew Jason as just really funny and sociable. They even had a nickname for him, Gentle Irish Giant, because he was so tall and was just genuinely a nice guy. While in North Carolina, Molly had joined a Bible study group and a book club, and she was close with many of the other members but they started noticing some inconsistencies in the things that Molly was saying. Molly would often mention that she was Sarah's real mom and would often talk about her experience with pregnancy and childbirth. Now, while Molly had been pregnant for a short period of time when she was with Keith before her miscarriage, she definitely was not Sarah's biological mom and had never actually given birth to any child. So when people started catching on to these lies, they obviously thought that they were a little strange. And Molly had started growing a borderline obsessive interest in the kids, especially Sarah, and it was concerning to outsiders. This obsession with Jack and Sarah started negatively affecting Molly and Jason's relationship. Shortly after getting married, Molly met with a lawyer to discuss what custody rights she had over Sarah and Jack. But the lawyer informed her that unless she legally adopted the kids, she really didn't have any custody rights if she and Jason were to divorce. So Molly became fixated on the idea of adopting Jack and Sarah. She had formed a very strong bond with them, and they loved her and even called her mom. But Jason was against Molly adopting the kids. According to Jason's sister Tracy, a few years after moving to North Carolina, Jason had actually started thinking about getting a divorce. He wanted to move back to Ireland so that his kids could grow up where he did. He didn't want Molly to have any legal custody over them because that would just cause more issues if they were to divorce. And apparently, Molly had started thinking about divorce as well, and she met with another lawyer. Again, she wanted to know what her rights to the children would be if she and Jason divorced. This time, she was told that she wouldn't have any custody rights over the children unless Jason was deemed unfit to care for them himself. So Molly then informed the lawyer that she and Jason would fight. A lot. And she said that the fights could get pretty bad. 
so the lawyer advised Molly to start secretly recording them whenever they were happening. Friends of Molly say that they remember Jason being controlling and possessive during this time. They said that he controlled what Molly wore, where she went, and who she talked to. He would demand to see her phone and her internet history because he was adamant that Molly was cheating on him and talking to other people. He would get angry and yell at her about how much money she was spending too. And according to Molly, Jason could buy whatever he wanted, but he would get angry at her if she bought extra groceries like a carton of raspberries or something even minor. Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon, were not too fond of their relationship either because they felt Jason was too controlling. At one point, Tom tried convincing Jason to let Molly adopt the kids, and he said that giving Molly adoption papers would be a really great birthday present for her. But this angered Jason, and he told Tom to never bring up the subject again. After this, Tom actually encouraged Molly to divorce Jason, but didn't do much else to intervene in their relationship because he didn't think that it was his place. But Molly, desperately wanting to maintain her relationship with the kids, decided not to move forward with a divorce. But she started treating Jason really poorly. Jason was incredibly homesick, and he missed his family and his friends. Because he was feeling so down, he had gained a few pounds, and Molly would berate him for this, and she would do this often. She would make jokes about his weight in front of other people, often upsetting him so much that he would have to leave. Then on August 1st, 2015, the family had a fairly normal day. They spent the day outside with their neighbors, enjoying a few drinks, hanging out, and neighbors had recalled that everything seemed mostly fine between the couple. But Jason did have to leave at one point because he was upset about something that Molly had said. Later that evening, Molly's parents arrived at the Corbett home. They wanted to surprise their grandchildren since they lived about five hours away and didn't get to see them very often. So Tom and Sharon even brought gifts for the kids, a baseball bat for Jack and a tennis racket for Sarah. But they decided to give the gifts to the kids in the morning. Jack had been at a birthday party that day and didn't get home until 11 p.m. and it was late and everyone was tired. So Jack and Sarah went to their rooms upstairs while Molly's parents stayed in a room in their basement. Molly and Jason retired to their own room, which was on the home's main level. Then in the early morning hours of August 2nd, 2015, Sarah knocked on Molly and Jason's door because she had a nightmare. Now this had actually been happening often and Molly was usually the one to calm Sarah down. Apparently it annoyed Jason when Sarah came into their room when she was scared. He felt that Sarah just needed to learn to fall back asleep on her own. So instead of just walking in, whenever something was wrong, the kids would knock on their parents' door, apparently hoping that by knocking, Jason wouldn't get as angry. So that night, Sarah knocked on the door and woke up Molly. Sarah had a dream that the fairies on her bedsheets were lizards and bugs. So Molly went to Sarah's room to help her. She took the sheets off the bed, put her back to sleep, and then went back to her room. Now, during all of the commotion, apparently Jason had woken up and was very angry. He didn't like that Molly was babying Sarah and said that she needed to get over these things by herself. He said that Molly shouldn't have been coddling her and should have just told her to go back to bed. This started a very loud argument between the two of them and things became very bad very quickly. Jason started choking Molly and Tom, hearing the argument and banging on the floor, ran upstairs to hear what was going on. However, before he went up the stairs, he grabbed that baseball bat that he was planning on giving Jack in the morning. When Tom burst into the room, he saw Jason choking Molly. Molly was trying to scream, but Jason had his hands over her mouth. So Tom yelled at Jason to let go of her, but he wouldn't. So Jason then put Molly in a chokehold, and he started dragging her toward the master bathroom, saying that he was going to kill her. So Tom then ran after him, and he hit Jason with the baseball bat. But Jason, remember, was a big guy, and the hit didn't really have much of an effect on him. So Jason was actually able to grab the bat away while still choking Molly. Tom then tried to grab the bat back with both of his hands, and he pulled so hard on it that it caused Jason to fall to the floor. Tom then started hitting Jason with the bat over and over and over again. Molly, worried that Jason was going to get back up, grabbed a brick from her nightstand, and started hitting Jason with it as well. Now eventually, Jason wasn't moving, and Tom thought that he was probably dead. So he called 911, and he explained what happened. Starting date, Sunday, August 2nd, 2015, at 3 hours, 2 minutes, and 17 seconds a.m. Yeah, 
County 911. What is the address of your emergency? Um, my name is Tom Martins. I'm at 160 Panther Creek Court, and we need help. Okay. What's uh, going on there? My my uh, daughter's husband, um, my son-in-law, um, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I I think um, he's in bad shape. We need help. Okay. What do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt. I mean, he's, He's bleeding all over, and I, I may have killed him. You know? All right. Okay. Tell me what happened. Did you hit him in the head, or I hit him in the head? With what? With a baseball bat. With a baseball bat. Yes, ma'am. He was choking. He was choking my daughter. He said, "I'm going to kill her." When the police arrived at the scene, what they found was absolutely brutal. Jason's head had been severely beaten. It was so bad that his face wasn't even recognizable. The police started trying to figure out what had happened, and the kids said that they had been asleep during the attack and that they didn't hear anything. Molly's mom, Sharon, said that she decided to stay downstairs for safety reasons, and she didn't see what happened either. So investigators then brought Tom and Molly to the station, where they both gave statements about what took place that night. Molly talked about Sarah's nightmare and the argument that ensued afterwards. She claimed that Jason had been excessively drinking for the entirety of the previous day, and that because of this, he was very hostile, even more so than usual. She told them that Jason choking her was not abnormal, and that it was something that he did often, especially during sex, but she brought up other forms of abuse as well. She said that Jason would often physically hurt her, and that she had actually gone to the hospital for it before. She just never told the hospital what her injuries were from because she was embarrassed. She said that when Jason was angry, he would step on her bad foot extremely hard and then pretend that it was an accident. And upon a physical examination, Molly did have a bruise on her foot, but that was really it, just a bruise. Molly, who claimed that she had been severely choked and in a fight for her life, barely even had a mark on her neck. There was a very small and light red spot, but investigators think that it might have been her own doing because she was seen kind of rubbing her neck over and over the entire night. The police also asked Molly about the brick because it obviously seemed really weird that she just happened to have a brick on her nightstand. But Molly said that she was going to paint it with the kids the next day and that she had brought it inside because it had been raining and she didn't want it to get wet. During this interview, Tom also confirmed that Jason had been heavily drinking that night. He recounted seeing Jason choking Molly and dragging her across the room. He claimed he heard Jason say, I'm going to kill her, as he tried bringing her into the bathroom. So hearing this, Tom had to save Molly and did what most fathers would do if their daughter was being physically assaulted. He claimed he acted in self-defense and only hit Jason until he felt that he wouldn't be able to get back up and kill them. But he woke up and he was angry and he wanted to know why I'd gotten up, and I told him it was because Sarah had had a nightmare, and then he was just furious because Sarah had been doing this lately, and, you know, she just wanted to be coddled, and she was too old for that, and I shouldn't have gotten out of bed. Molly says knowing her parents were in the house gave her more courage to stand up for herself. I said, she's just eight, she had a nightmare, <laughs> I should be allowed to go upstairs and comfort our daughter, you know, all she wanted was her mom to lay with her for a couple minutes, and he forgot my parents were there. I don't know what precisely woke me up, but what I heard were loud voices and a kind of, a, like thumping. Something bad was going on. So I grabbed that Little League baseball bat, and I ran upstairs. He wanted to shut me up, so he covered my mouth, and then he started choking me. But at some point, when he stopped, I screamed. The next thing I remember is my dad standing in the doorway. What'd you see? It's awful. He has his hands around her neck, and he quickly moves to move her in front of him between me, and so he's got her in a, a chokehold. Fear was, you know, secondary at that point. I was just so ashamed that my father would see me like that allowing myself to be treated like that. Tom said that they were both fighting for their lives, and his explanation made it seem like he was in a very brutal fight. But a physical examination of Tom showed that like Molly, he didn't have any marks on his body either. And one would think that if you were acting out of self-defense, surely you would have some types of defensive marks on your body, right? So Tom ended his interview with a very strange statement. 
he said that Jason's previous wife, Mags, died of suspicious circumstances, suggesting that she had actually died from being choked, not from an asthma attack after all. In general, Molly and Tom weren't worried that they were going to get in trouble with the police. They knew it was self-defense, and they even said so when they were initially brought into the police station that night. So they were both eventually released, but things were far from over. Over the next couple of days, Jack and Sarah were interviewed by a child psychologist. Both children gave statements saying that Jason and Molly fought a lot. They said that not only did the couple yell at each other all the time, but they had both seen Jason hurt Molly. They said that their dad was angry all the time, and Jack said that he had seen Jason step on Molly's foot before. So the kids' statements made Tom and Molly's claim of self-defense more believable. But the kids would eventually recant their statements once they were taken into custody of Jason's sister, Tracy. In his will, Jason had given custody of the children to Tracy. So when she came to the U.S., she told investigators that she didn't think that Molly was being entirely truthful. She said that Jason was days away from leaving Molly and taking the kids back to Ireland. She thought that this could have been a possible motive for killing Jason. She told investigators that Molly gaslit Jason and used his love for his kids and grief over his wife Mag's passing against him. She claimed that Molly's entire goal was to somehow gain custody over Jack and Sarah. So during the investigation, police discovered that days before his murder, Jason had a doctor's appointment and had told a nurse that he had been feeling angry at random and at random times for no reason at all. Molly had coincidentally been prescribed trazodone a few days before Jason's death, and Jason's family, Tracy especially, speculated that these random bouts of anger were because Molly was secretly drugging Jason. Now, trazodone is an antidepressant, and some of the main side effects include anxiety, agitation, panic attacks, difficulty sleeping, irritability, hostility, and impulsivity. On top of all of this, Jason had a life insurance policy for $600,000, and his family thought that this would be another motive for Molly to murder him. Obviously, things were very tense between Molly and Jason's family. Molly's family had their version of what had happened, and Jason's family had their version. Jason's family was convinced that Molly and her father had planned this entire thing, and that it didn't just happen. You see, in their opinion, Molly's parents didn't randomly decide to visit the family, but had actually been secretly planning this visit with Molly for days. They thought her father purposefully brought the bat and disguised it as a gift, and that Molly purposefully brought the brick into her bedroom. Now, because tensions were high and so high, Molly wouldn't let any of Jason's family attend the funeral. Tracy argued with Molly over cremating Jason's body and sending his remains back to Ireland. Molly didn't want to do this, but after all of the arguing, Molly finally agreed on the terms that Tracy would have to pay for everything. After this, Molly continued her life almost as if nothing had happened. She started taking college classes, joined clubs, and would constantly post on social media about how much she missed her kids. Investigators were starting to seriously doubt Tom and Molly's self-defense story, though. Through the investigation, they discovered all of the lies that Molly had told and were really doubting her character. But even more damning was the crime scene itself. Tom and Molly claimed they only hit Jason until they believed he was no longer a threat. However, he was so badly beaten that investigators could see his brain matter. He was also beaten mostly on the back of his head, meaning he wasn't even facing them during the fight. While Molly and Tom both claimed that Jason had been drinking heavily that day, a blood alcohol test showed that Jason's blood alcohol level was so low that someone his size could not have been severely drunk after all. Additionally, blood spatter analysis indicated that the majority of the blood spray from the crime scene was on the lower half of the walls. This meant that Jason had to be on the floor while he was being beaten, and to investigators, someone who was on the floor wasn't much of a threat. So this started to look like Tom and Molly didn't just beat Jason until he wasn't a threat anymore, but purposefully did much more than that. So on December 18th, 2015, Tom and Molly were arrested for second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. 
Both pled not guilty, and the trial began on July 17, 2017. The judge on the case said that the defense could not use Jack and Sarah's original statements because they had recanted them, so Molly and Tom were depending on the claim that the entire thing was self-defense. They really honed in on the fact that Tom had worked for the FBI and hoped that this would make him seem more credible. Tom testified while Molly did not, and they spoke about the night as if the struggle was so intense that it was a matter of life and death. However, the fact that Tom and Molly were left virtually unscathed made this argument far less convincing. The state relied on the blood spatter analysis and the physical evidence that was found at the scene. They hoped that by showing the jury just how brutally Jason had been beaten, it would show that Molly and Tom did not just beat Jason until he wasn't a threat anymore, that they did much more than that. So Jason was too mutilated for this to simply be self-defense. And the trial ended on August 9th, and the jury deliberated for six hours. Tom and Molly were found guilty of second-degree murder, and they were sentenced to 20 to 25 years in jail. But it was far from over, and there was going to be another twist in this entire thing. You see, Tom and Molly immediately filed for an appeal, and they worked to appeal the case and stated many reasons for doing so. First, they felt that the members of the jury had broken many rules. Some jury members had immediately posted about the trial on social media after it was over, and one had told a journalist that jury members discussed the case outside of the courtroom, which breaks many jury confidentiality rules. So Tom and Molly also felt that it was unfair that Sarah and Jack's initial statements were not included in the trial. They also felt the jury had formed premature opinions about Molly and that she was a bad person, even though she didn't testify. They felt that the jury was biased, and Tom and Molly were initially denied, but they brought the appeal to the state Supreme Court, and they won in 2021. Tom and Molly were released from jail, and a retrial was set for November 2023. The retrial was set in one county over at the request of Tom and Molly. They felt that holding the trial in the same county would be working against them. Additionally, Tom and Molly took a plea deal. The charge of second-degree murder would be dropped if Tom pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and Molly pleaded no contest to the charge of voluntary manslaughter. So this basically means that she isn't saying she didn't do the crime, but she isn't saying that she did it either. Because of this, they weren't trying to find out whether Tom and Molly were guilty or not but instead were going to trial for a resentencing in hopes that their sentences could be reduced. Some things can get misconstrued, uh, and from a media angle, they have to play you know, certain things to, to reach ratings and what have you. But at the end of the day, my dad and sister did not murder Jason Corbett. Um, and I, I think there's plenty of evidence to support that, uh, particularly you know, my dad being in the FBI, a retired FBI agent for 35 years and having so much of a background to prove that he's an incredibly calm individual um, and to say that he committed this act maliciously, I think um, is, is pretty horrendous. And I think the evidence that would be included now um, after the court's decision would uh, definitely validate uh, that decision. So let's talk about some of the things that were said and, you know, clear up maybe, I guess, what your understanding of what was said. Yeah, so uh, at, at the trial, um, when everything came down on August 9th, um, I was definitely in shock and Molly and my dad were, were pretty hysterical. It's definitely something that's tough to, uh, to swallow. And um, one of the things that Molly said um, when they were sentenced was, I'm so sorry uh, that I screamed, Mom. I wish that uh, he had just killed me. And I, I feel like there's been a misconception and that was mis um, misrepresented that she said, I'm sorry, admitting her guilt. Uh, and that was definitely not the reaction. Uh, she, if anything, she felt guilty that her dad was tied in uh, to the situation. This time, the defense was able to include Jack and Sarah's initial statements. In these statements, the children discussed seeing Molly cry after fighting with Jason and having to physically pull the two away from each other when they were fighting. They said that the fights would get really bad. They also stated that their father never got physical with them, but that he would yell at them often. The defense also claimed that the only reason that the kids recanted these statements was because his sister Tracy forced them to after she obtained custody of them. The defense even played a recording of an argument that Molly had taken at the suggestion of her lawyer. 
Like I mentioned earlier, Molly had once visited a lawyer to discuss divorcing Jason, and this lawyer suggested that Molly secretly record the fights between the two of them. In the recording, Jason is angry that the kids ate dinner before he came home. The argument escalated, and at the end of the recording, you hear both children yell at the couple and ask them to stop fighting. In general, the defense really changed their tactics this time around. Specifically, they decided to really hone in on the claim that Jason abused Molly. They discussed how Jason would stomp on Molly's foot and how he sent Molly to the hospital for a head injury after shoving her head into the headboard of their bed. They discussed how Jason often choked Molly for sexual satisfaction, and they suggested that this is how Jason's first wife, Mags, had died as well. They even had one expert testify that there was no evidence that Mags died from an asthma attack. This expert claimed that Mags' lungs were not inflamed at the time of her death and therefore likely died from a homicide. Another expert, Dr. Bill Smock, claimed that there was evidence that Mags died from strangulation. However, another expert, Dr. William Bozeman, claimed that there was no evidence of strangulation. So Molly's mom, Sharon, also took to the stand to tell her side of the story. And this was her first time doing so. During the first trial, Tom testified under oath that Molly never claimed that Jason verbally abused her. But Sharon claimed that they knew that Molly and Jason fought their whole marriage. She said even the kids would tell them about the fighting. Sharon said she wrote her phone number on a piece of paper and placed it under a doll, and she apparently told the kids to call that number if things ever got bad, and she gave each kid a code word if things ever got physical between Jason and Molly. Jack's code word was Galaxy, and Sarah's was Peacock. Sharon claimed that Jason was very drunk when they arrived at the Corbin home that night, and when they heard the commotion upstairs in the middle of the night, Sharon said that Tom told her to stay downstairs, so she did. Eventually, she fell back asleep when things calmed down, which, I'm not going to lie, kind of sounds suspicious to me because I don't think I could just stay downstairs and no less fall back asleep if I heard my daughter screaming and crying for help upstairs and my husband went to go check on her. I definitely wouldn't be able to just fall back asleep. So Tom would also take the stand and ended up admitting that he might have hit Jason one too many times. But he defended this by saying that he was so overwhelmed by what was happening to his daughter that his mind went blank and he couldn't stop. In general, the prosecution focused on the abundance of lies that Molly told during her marriage with Jason. Jack, Sarah, and members of Jason's family attended the retrial and confirmed these lies. Many of them had to leave the room when they were discussing the claims that Jason killed Mags. They were so disgusted that Molly and her father would even suggest such a thing. Jack and Sarah pleaded with the judge not to reduce Tom and Molly's sentences. They claimed they had no love for Molly and that she had coached them on what to say after everything initially happened. They admitted that Jason and Molly would verbally fight, but they never saw their father lay a hand on Molly. They spoke about how deeply they love and miss their father as well, and they begged the judge not to fall under Molly's spell and not to believe the lies that she had become such an expert at telling. At the end of the retrial, the judge sentenced Tom and Molly to a minimum of four years in prison. However, he also gave them a credit for the time that they already spent in prison. So this means that Tom and Molly will only spend about seven more months in prison. Molly was also ordered to have no contact with any members of Jason's family, including Jack and Sam. never know what really happened on August 2nd, 2015. We will never really know what Jason and Molly's relationship was like and what Molly and Tom were thinking that night that they killed Jason. Was it really an act of self-defense? Or was this planned by Molly and Tom in advance? Or maybe they didn't plan it, but it went overboard in the heat of the moment. While we may differ in how we view these events, what we can all agree on is that a man's life was sadly taken away from him, and two children had their father brutally taken away from them as well. Their lives will be forever changed. They lost their mom and then their father. While they're living a good life in Ireland with Jason's family, nothing and no one will ever replace their parents. So like I said at the beginning, this case divides a lot of people. So I would love to know your thoughts, but please in a respectful way in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for hearing Jason's story today, and I'm curious to know what you think about this case. Until the next one, stay safe. Bye.